So um, good morning, and we are um, the Vermont Legislature's Committee on Environment and Energy, and we are going to shift gears a little bit to welcome Peggy Stevens from um, which don't undermine them for Magog's purity uh, <laughs> um, with <clears throat> thoughts on H48. Welcome, Peggy Stevens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Sheldon for this opportunity to testify in support of H48, an act <clears throat> relating to solid waste. And thank you, Representative Smith, for your support for H48 based upon your personal experience and knowledge and concern related to solid waste issues in the Northeast Kingdom. And thank all of you for your time today. My name is Peggy Stevens. I live in the Northeast Kingdom on Echo Lake in East Charleston and have had a long time interest in water quality and ways we can protect and preserve this invaluable resource. I've testified twice before, I actually recognize some of you. Um, I've testified twice before, uh, excuse me, uh, um, on ways that we could as Vermonters, uh, work together to protect water quality and to share with you information about Northeast Kingdom, uh, GUMP, an advocacy organization, which stands for Don't Undermine and for Mangog's Purity. GUMP formed in 2018 and formally represents over a hundred uh, Northeast Kingdom and can Canadian citizens. Um, we work with the Memphis Mangog uh, Conservation Incorporated to defend and protect the watershed and water quality of our international lake, which is drinking water reservoir for over 175,000 of our Quebec neighbors. This is important to us. Over time, we've earned the support of many more citizens across Vermont who are alarmed by the expansion of the Coventry landfill, Vermont's only landfill, which threatens our regions and our state's environmental health and safety. My previous testimony to this committee focused on water quality and the problems associated with hosting Vermont's only poorly sited landfill. The difference in my testimony today is that our perspective has significantly broadened and we realize that the Coventry landfill is not the only problem. Solid waste management policy and practice in Vermont is the real problem. To solve the problem will require decision-making guided by a new vision for the future of solid waste management and disposal in Vermont. H48, sponsored by a bipartisan coalition of 14 Northeast Kingdom representatives, recognizes that Vermont's solid waste management issues and policy have been ignored too long and must be addressed now. The state's only landfill in Coventry will reach capacity in about 20 years. It can be argued it's past capacity now, given its inappropriate hydrogeological siting adjacent to wetlands, uphill from and in close proximity to the Black River and the South Bay of Lake Mexico. To make matters worse though, there's no plan B, no backup, an unsustainable reality immediate action is imperative. This work cannot be done in a policy vacuum. Our current solid po waste policy found in VSA 10 section 6601 was last amended in 1987, 36 years ago. The benefit of a review and update of Vermont solid waste policy is obvious. For example, the 1987 policy is silent on toxic PFAS chemicals and landfill leachate, because little was known or understood about them at the time. An up-to-date overarching policy will provide context for recent legislative efforts to curb PFAS contamination, upstream, midstream, and downstream, as well as for legislative efforts like the bottle bills, the plastic bag bill, and other bills designed to help Vermonters reduce, reuse, and recycle, <laughs> cut down on the amount of personal waste destined for disposal. One cruel irony today is that for every ton of waste, Vermont potentially keeps from the landfill an equal amount of solid waste from out of state, much of which is contaminated, is brought in to make up the difference in the permitted 600,000 tons annually. Until there's coherent solid waste policy, catch 22s like this will persist. 
H48 requires that study committee be formed to examine landfill siting and materials management issues. This committee, made up of broad representation of stakeholders, as outlined in H48, will work towards environmental justice and protection, focusing on safe, appropriate alternative siting that by default would reduce the numbers of miles required to haul our waste, saving untold gallons of fossil fuels burned and greenhouse gases produced. Issues related to controlling if and what waste may be imported would also be addressed. A materials management focus will ensure that a current plan is developed reflecting what science tells us today will protect our land, air, and water resources, especially drinking water reservoirs. The publication of the 2018 USGS research project about the 25 to 40% of Memphamagog's brown bullhead species with cancerous lesions roused attention in our community and around the state about the current condition of Memphamagog's water quality. <laughs> Brown bullhead with these cancers are not found anywhere else in Vermont and are only found in environmentally contaminated waters, which is a clear indication that Memphamagog's waters are environmentally contaminated, with which the ANR does not argue. USGS research resumes this spring to try to determine the causative factors for the cancers, but evidence of contamination existing right now in the lake's water suggests that no further contamination should be allowed to occur in the watershed, deliberate or accidental. Since 2018, Gump has provided comment in many public hearings related to our Northeast Kingdom solid waste future, along with significant numbers of Northeast Kingdom and Vermont uh, citizens statewide, including Representative Swift, Rep Representative Page, and Representative Labor. We have been building our connections with a bipartisan coalition of our Northeast Kingdom legislators talking together about these critical issues. The passage of the landmark environmental justice legislation last session served to further underscore the dilemma faced by the citizens and the environment of the Northeast Kingdom. The Northeast Kingdom has become a sacrifice zone with over a hundred diesel trucks daily, traveling hundreds of miles round trip, carrying tons of waste from in and out of state and spewing tons of greenhouse gases into Vermont's air. Of the permitted 600,000 tons of solid waste dumped annually in Coventry, a mere 7% comes from the Northeast Kingdom. 73% is generated from the rest of Vermont 20% comes from out of state. The million plus gallons per month of leachate then produced by these tons of permitted waste containing bioaccumulative toxic forever compounds is the pernicious byproduct of our solid waste production and one requiring vast resources to render safe. The issue of leachate treatment capable of effectively scrubbing leachate of its toxic contaminants is arguably one of the most pressing solid waste issues facing Vermont and our nation and our natural resources today. <clears throat> Only the most effective technology, not the most cost effective, will be required to ensure leachate is scrubbed to new more stringent standards for PFAS exposure recommended by the EPA in 2022. And may I add that for PFOA and PFOS, which are the most common of those compounds, the exposure limit is basic, it's nil. There is no safe exposure limit. The sense of urgency underlying this, uh, underlying this solid waste management crisis cannot be overstated, nor can the fact that the only action that will make a significant and enduring change in solid waste management policy process and practice must come from an informed legislature. Only sound evidence-based policy development, including lawmaking, regulation, and oversight by our state legislature can ensure safe management of the solid waste produced by every single citizen and community in the state of Vermont. Transparency, and community involvement every step of the way is crucial. If public faith is to be restored and maintained, 
and public consciousness raised. Out of sight and out of mind not only doesn't work for the Northeast Kingdom, it doesn't work for the rest of Vermont either. All of us need to wake up to the fact that when it comes to throwing stuff away, as Bill McKibben put it, there is no away. Determining an appropriate alternative site for future solid waste management and disposal, including for leachate treatment, will take time and expertise, as will the planning and engineering required to ensure the safest and soundest possible depository for our state's solid waste and its residuals. H48 provides the means to begin planning now. As an engaged legislature, providing oversight to ensure our natural resources and public health are protected will be the outcome. I appreciate that you're listening and that you recognize the urgency of this issue and your inherent responsibility to create change. Our lakes and ponds, rivers and streams are Vermont's most precious, finite resource. Clean water, once compromised, cannot be brought back to safe drinking standard standards, at least not without astronomical expense, if we're lucky. Thank you for your action on age 48. You can be assured of ample bipartisan support as you enact this legislation, establishing a study committee to address this existential issue, environmentally protective and just solid waste management and disposal. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I, <clears throat> your testimony came with a couple of handouts. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, actually, yeah, I'm curious about the map side of it. Um, sure. And Kind of how you drew the boundaries, like why was oh. Rutland County called out, for example, or um, this this um, <coughs> information. I'm sorry, I gave away on the handout. <laughs> Thank you. I can look it up here. Great. Um, this came from News VT. They're required to report to the state on a regular basis. Uh, what about the tonnage? And in the tonnage, the monthly tonnage reports, which believe me, we have poured over. Many times uh, you can extract the information about where tons come from within the state. And so that is how these percentages were developed. Um, obviously, the concentration in Chittenden County um, represents a significant part on its own. Um, uh, I know the um, the numbers for each of the individual counties within the 39% aren't expressed on this map, but they could easily be. If you would like to know, I'd be happy to get you that information. I just didn't know how you, how you called them out. No, um, it's all basically from uh, the News VT quarterly rep reports. Why did you separate Rutland County out? Um, you know, I don't know. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> it stood out for me. That's okay. No, I, I, I get what you're saying, Amy. I, I, I will inquire. Okay. And then I'm curious, um, 175,000 Quebec folks drink from the lake. How many Vermonters? Um, we, have, we have not been able to ascertain. There are still camps on the lake on the U.S. side. You know, most of the lake is three fourths of the lake is in Canada. Um, there are camps on Memphis Magog that still do pump water out of the lake. Um, although I'm not aware of anyone anymore that's drinking. Most people dr bring their drinking water in. They might use the water to bathe or, or wash dishes or something, but they don't drink it. Thank you, Peggy. Yeah, I understand. Right. Yeah. Any other questions from members? Uh, Representative Pat. Okay, a couple of questions. First, um, do you, are you in in your own thinking about solutions to this? And I, you know, and and, and I fully understand uh, the 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 uh, the issues involved in this. Uh, is there any thought in terms of? Uh, I mean, currently the Coventry landfill takes some of its trash from 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 across the border in other, in other states. Um, 
to, to me, it ultimately, from an environmental point of view, the, the political boundaries uh, don't, don't matter. Are, are there any um, uh, places in Vermont, particularly I'm thinking in the extreme southern part of Vermont, where, where, where the trash currently goes to landfill, perhaps in another state? Out of state, yes. I okay. believe it's... Um... Uh, I, I don't want to say the exact number, okay. but so, there is a certain amount of uh, solid waste that is exported to, I believe, New Hampshire. Okay. That's why I said uh, <clears throat> roughly 73 percent from the rest of okay. Vermont, because I know a little bit does go out. And, you know, the leachate, a lot of it goes to New York State okay. right now and ends up in the Champlain which is a okay. great concern as well. Um, no, another question is, uh, this is from previous uh, 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 sort of uh, this knowledge about the Coventry landfill. I know more about that landfill than, than the average person. Huh. Um, but um, uh, it, it, back in, uh, I, 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 I was general manager of Washington Electric Co-op when the landfill oh, right. plant was built there. Yeah. But, but at that time, what I learned was that there were um, closed but unlined landfills in Quebec that were also contributing to water quality issues in the lake. And I, they were they were not uh, there was no new trash going in there, but there still was uh, uh, some effect. You, you know I do know about, about that, that because the questions come up previously. Um, there was a landfill that has been closed now for quite a while in Canada. Mm -hmm. They take the leachate and they dispose of it, uh, I believe, in Sherbrooke, south of the city's water supply and i shouldn't say for sure which river it is but i know it is diverted away from the memphis watershed um the we are aware of a couple i believe four small wastewater trees treatment facilities in municipalities on lake memphis um but in terms of discharge, and I can also get you the numbers for those because we've run these numbers as comparison. Uh, for example, in the um, U.S. part of the watershed, I believe there are at least five municipalities that have what, wastewater treatment facilities that dis discharge mm -hmm. into the lake eventually. OK, that is not uh, the case. It's not really comparable in terms of, of Canada. I understand your question, mm -hmm. but definitely. The, the U.S. It contributes three fourths of the water in the lake from our watershed, and it can, you know. So I guess just going from there. Okay, and I just wanted, just in terms of your thoughts, obviously, if if there is any the discussion in, in the study of citing a landfill, or you know, uh, that the, uh, the obvious question is who would want. You know yeah. who, who would who would want that? Yeah. Um, and uh, I just wonder whether you have any thoughts on it because in in my uh, background, when when the uh, when that uh, when I was back involved, and it's been a, quite a few years now, uh, the Moortown landfill was still open, and mm -hmm. as you know, it had some significant issues that closed it uh, right. early. It was much smaller. It was going to close earlier any anyway. Right. Uh, so. How do we, uh, these are just asking, how do, how do we um, go through a process that, that gets it to be acceptable if we need to site another landfill somewhere? You know, who's, who's going to want that, I guess? Well, that is the charge for this committee. You know, I'm not going to even begin to get out of my skis about that. Do I have opinions personally? Absolutely. But... Um, I am aware that there are at least three other sites in the state based on a landfill siting study that was done, I believe, in 2020. There have been three hydrogeologically appropriate sites, sites identified in a central area in Vermont. Uh, what I wanted to bring your attention to was the other side of the page, um, you know, looking north to Canada, which is where the waters flow, because our waters flow north. Um, and then you turn and you look south and there's what our, our folks call Mount Trashmore. And um, the point is, we call it an outdated model because it is an outdated model. Um, landfills never have to look like that again. 
landfill technology in this day and age is entirely different. And um, I think that would be one of the goals of the committee as well. Thank you. Uh, Representative Bongarts. Okay, great. All right, Representative Tory. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I just glanced through the bill um, now, so uh -huh. too carefully, but I didn't see anything about anyone from a like, utility or an energy background. Um, and since, as you know, Coventry has had a side benefit of fighting electricity. I just wondered if that was an oversight. Or yeah, I know. And um, I completely agree. That would be totally appropriate because the landfill gas is a byproduct that captured effectively so that it doesn't escape and contaminate the air uh, is, is a, a, a positive residual. So I would completely agree that when a committee is formed, that should definitely be addressed. Yeah. And it's possible that there are other considerations that need to be provided in terms of who are relevant stakeholders. We just want to get this off the ground. <laughs> There's so much left to be done once the committee gets established. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. And call on me anytime. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, members, we have our next witness here. Charlie Baker, would you, are you ready to join us? Sure. Okay. So quick, and I apologize. I just discovered my laptop's a little dead. Uh, do you need me to plug into anything so you can... City or get power. It'd be great if you were in the Zoom room and could run your own slides if you have slides. Okay. Um, I have a letter that I did provide to. If we would have that. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't need slides, then yeah, we're all set. Um, great. I just want to make the public service announcement. Then we're now shifting gears back to S100, the housing bill with Charlie Baker, um, and also we've been the update to our agenda for this morning is Graham Mink, who's listed, is not able to join us, so, um, but Peter Tucker is. Okay, so we'll still have still hear from those folks. So welcome, Charlie Baker. Thank you very much. It's been a little while since I've been in this room, but uh, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, for the record, my name is Charlie Baker. Uh, I am here on behalf of the Vermont Association of Planning and Development Agencies, which is the state association for RPCs. Uh, I'm our government relations committee chair, uh, which is why I'm here. Uh, and also during the day, I work at the Chittenden County RPC. Um, so I did send you a letter that uh, represents uh, the position of RPCs, but uh, I'll first want to start with the thanking you for the work that you've been doing uh, to address housing and protect our environment. Um, and note that we do strongly as the RPC support S100 just generally uh, in terms of trying to address uh, and ease the barriers to housing production in the state and encourage smart growth. Um, and so most so everything I say is kind of in that uh, realm of how to promote smart growth um, in Vermont um, better than we do today. Um, I tried to group the comments here in kind of high priority, medium priority, low priority. Um, but and try to be specific with any edits um, that uh, we were suggesting. Um, so some of these I'm going to move past real quickly because I think you've probably heard about them before, and I won't waste a lot of time there. First one is the water uh, waste the wastewater permit duplication issue between DEC and municipalities. Um, that is in section 15 of H68. Uh, we think that would be a helpful thing, um, and it's a process of from our view, does not add a lot of value right now. So um, we think that could go away and help. The second one is also um, not in the bill, uh, but is really about data collection. And the fact that, um, I'm sorry, I, I've worked in, in a couple other states before moving to Vermont. Um, it is really horrendous. <laughs> we don't, I mean, there's nobody that can tell you how many houses got built last year and where they were built in Vermont. Um, and so just uh, we're suggesting a, a little change in the grand list statute. Um, and I think there may be some conversation. Uh, I don't know if it's another bill or some other study with the tax department 
that might pick this up, but um, just really wanted to flag how important this is. Uh, and we think a minor change to the data collection in the grand list could capture the number of units and obviously attach them to a parcel, which would be really helpful. Um, and so you see on the top of the second page, just that phrase being added to one provision of the grand list statute. Uh, the third item is also not in the bill. Uh, it was in an early version, of, and I apologize to represent Bonvert. I can't remember if it's in H68 or not, but um, rural towns and urban towns are treated differently in the planning section of statute uh, with regards to how plans and bylaws are even adopted. And so in large towns, the elected body is yeah. the body that does it, the legislative body, the select board, city council. In small towns, they go to the voters, um, which to, from our view has an undermining effect of addressing uh, uh, you know, new policies that a town may wanna take on. Particularly, uh, this is, I think, undermined the implementation of municipal plans. So zoning changes in towns and villages um, are often voted down with kind of bumper sticker logos <laughs> that, that go out, um, yeah, front porch forum or however uh, communication happens in that town. Um, and it's just in the, this is just the planning statute that there's this particular provision. Um, and so uh, we're recommending some language to you for your consideration that would delete that uh, kind of disparate treatment of rural towns for your consideration. Um, and the last thing we're recommending that's not in the bill right now is H5. Um, so H5 is a bill uh, that uh, Representative Bongart's introduced, thank you, uh, that would have the RPCs uh, study how to improve our future land use planning. So we all have some statutory uh, requirements now to do regional plans, include a future land use plan within that. Um, but, and this kind of goes back to how well our plans are implemented. Um, we need to do a better job of being consistent about how we do that across the state and uh, better integration with municipalities and the state in terms of uh, implementing those plans that we all work on collaboratively. Um, so we're asking uh, for, for H5 or, or something very similar to be added to uh, S100, if you're open to that. Happy to talk more about that, but this is also, I think as, you, uh, as this committee has been talking over maybe a few years about uh, place-based jurisdiction and things, uh, we feel like we have a role and we've, played a pretty significant role in terms of mapping and analysis and planning in our communities. Um, and so uh, I think we want to come back to you with some suggestions of how to strengthen the system and, and kind of purposefully using that kind of system where you know, we're in the middle between <clears throat> towns and the state. Um, and so if there's ways that we can improve what we do to help the municipalities and the state achieve their objectives, uh, we want to come back to you with those suggestions. So I don't know, any questions on that one? That's a, a new one or? Um, I have a bunch of questions, but so I maybe was gonna let you get through your testimony if there's a lot more, or we can, uh, we can talk about. I, that's fair. I, I probably have another half a dozen points and then we can come back to any of them. Or any, I mean, is your bucket of things not in the bill? Is that, have you? Th those, yeah, that was the end of that, yeah. Okay. So maybe we'll, it's a good time for questions on on the kind of on all of those. Um, so, I am interested in the, just a little more information on like your, your experience and perceptions of why towns don't have zoning. Um, and then also the variation among the zoning ordinances that are out there and who is, is there any, I, I don't think there's any oversight necessarily of them. And what is the solution to that? I mean, we are being asked to, um, consider uh, sort of location-based jurisdiction in this bill based on whether, if a town has a zoning bylaw and a subdivision bylaw, but there's, where's the accountability there? Um, it's a good question. Uh, part, part of uh, my brain went to, um, that's part of the reason we wanna do H5 and that study to make some recommendations. You're right there. Um, there isn't a ton of accountability back to the state or, or the region in terms of municipal zoning. Um, obviously, it's municipal zoning is supposed to implement their plans. Um, there is 
some aspect of a review of town plans uh, by the RPC if the town asks, uh, but they have to ask for us to review their town plan approval, um, you know, and that's, that's a mixed bag around the state, it, even with regards to, I guess part of your question was around zoning, like the number, there's a number of towns that don't have any zoning whatsoever, or maybe just minimal floodplain protections, right? Um, and that's kind of an option. This, the state allows towns not to have zoning. Um, I'm not quite sure. I'm, I don't. I haven't worked with any of those towns, so I can't tell you exactly why that happens. Um, other than they don't see the need to do it, um, and so haven't done it. Um, but um, in terms of accountability on it, on zoning, I do think that there could be some strengthening of like looking at how zoning is implementing their plans. Actually, I feel like S100. Just if I can generalize for a moment is really about the failure of implementing our plans. Yeah. Like every town village has a plan to, you know, they all sound good. Our PCs wrote a lot of them. <laughs> so, um, they all talk about how they wanna you know, reinvigorate the village and have more things happen, but yet the implementation doesn't really happen very often. Uh, and so this, to me, S100 is trying to address that uh, and kind of say, we need to kind of update our zoning and what happens in our towns because it hasn't happened organically. Um, and partly that's part of the reason like the Australian value provision we feel is important is because that's been one of the tools that has been used to undermine those changes to implement plans. And my kind of follow-up interest is that we don't seem to have data on zoning ordinances and yet we are kind of reaching in to change them at the state level. Um, what do you mean by Data, like how many oh, towns have zones? Many towns perhaps don't allow du duplexes, oh. or um, like what? What is the? Yeah. What are? Where's the demonstration of the problem we're trying to solve there? Um, yeah, well, I think you probably have gotten other testimony from VHFA and um, you know Catherine Dimitri was here from Northwest RPC talking about their housing needs analysis. I I certainly believe I think the RPC directors generally unanimously believe that we do have a housing crisis and we're not doing enough to produce housing. Um, you just look at the trend lines and you know, we produce a lot less housing than we did 30 or 40 years ago. Um, if I was going to be a little crueler, I would say we've had 30 years of disinvesting in our housing industry. Um, and so that's caused all kinds of issues. We don't have enough contractors and we've also, it's caused the market to split. So we've, use a lot of taxpayer funding to fund affordable housing development. We have, um, and I will say this from my experience of working in other states, Vermont probably has the strongest affordable housing production uh, system in the country. And I don't, I don't say that with, with I, I really believe that, um, but that's at the bottom end of the market. And then because we haven't really invested in the system in the middle and haven't allowed things to happen, um, we also have the high end, right? We have single family, expensive single family homes that are, you know, custom builders. And so the middle part of the segment that, you know, does workforce housing, you know, all what you will, has really been starved in Vermont. Um, so I think is S100 the be all end all? No, it's a step in the right direction though. Um, I, I, in my experience um, in working in another state where we did, these kinds of zoning focus changes. Um, and I actually just went back for a retirement party two weeks ago and ran into a council person who's like, but you did 15 years ago. And I worked on what we call the workforce housing bill at the time, but it was basically doing these kinds of things. It was all process changes. It wasn't money. It wasn't huge. I uh, think it was process changes like this. And he said, that has had such a significant impact in our community that I still campaign on being the sponsor of that bill 15 years ago, because our housing has stayed affordable, we're producing workforce housing. And so I truly do believe that changes like this, um, and this is part of the system that we have of permitting here, right? We're, this isn't uh, doing a lot to address Act 250 changes or changes in DEC, uh, but can have a really positive impact. Where, was that a different jurisdiction that you're talking oh, about? Oh yeah, it was in the state of Delaware. Yeah, different market on I-95, not the same place. That's why I'm here. So, um, <laughs> but, um, so um, yeah, hopefully that helps a little context. 
Yes. Um, <coughs> Representative Sibelia. Oh, just to the point of kind of the middle um, housing that uh, is not being built. One of the things that I'm um, hoping that we may be able to add or see uh, included in S100 is some sort of um, kind of annual accounting, um, some sort of, um, some way for us to grapple with the factors that are contributing to that. So i um, been talking with Commissioner Hanford, love to hear from the RPCs, what are the factors that would be really important for us to understand. Um, you know, I understand that there's challenges around the data for um, private um, investment in homes. How can we um, kind of roll that information up so that we have a better sense of kind of the comprehensive thing that's happening with housing where and where we're not where we're not seeing it. So let's actually get some quantification. Here is what's happening um, in the um, private sector. Uh, They're talking about that. They're giving us language. Awesome. In there. Perfect. Yeah, that's that. That was the recommendation around the grand list. Yeah, you know, to at least get the the how many housing units and what type of housing they are. Perfect. We don't even have that basic data. And uh, and I uh, not to speak for the department whatsoever. I did I did have a, a quick conversation with the commissioner a number of weeks ago. Um, there's another provision um, in the bill about uh, uh, a tweak to the. Uh, the housing section of the planning statute um, and more reliance and asking the department to actually set targets for each region um, as part of the statewide housing needs assessment that they do. Um, that would be really helpful to us. Um, the RPCs get lots of asks for that. Like, well, what should we be shooting for? Should we be shooting for 100 new homes over the next 10 years or 100 homes over the next year? Like, you know, it matters. And what kinds of housing should they be? Um, uh, VHFA has done those housing needs assessments the last couple of times. Uh, every, they do them every five years as part of the HUD requirements. They are helpful, uh, but they're, um, and that's where that 30 to 40,000 need came from. But um, it's, not, uh, it's not disaggregated in terms of that target, like where, where and what kinds of housing do we need most in what parts of the state? Um, and maybe, maybe a lot of it's rehab, right? Uh, maybe it's not new production. Uh, which is fine. Um, and at the same time, we're dealing with our climate challenge. You know, we know we need to weatherize those homes and um, you know, look at different fuel sources, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot more work to be done and totally could not agree more with you on the data point. Great. So can we continue? Okay. All right. Uh, the fifth uh, comment we had is in section two. Um, and we understand that this is trying to allow duplexes kind of by right in single family zoning districts and also where there's municipal water and sewer uh, for a unit or a fourplex uh, dwelling unit uh, where the by right. Um, we're proposing just some language to make it a little clearer if that's the intention. Um, so, um, and uh, I met with the Vermont planners a couple of days ago. There's definitely confusion in the plan, confusion in the planning community about what is actually intended by these few sentences here. Uh, so this is, if you're trying to make uh, those more by right and get treated like single family homes, here's some wording for your consideration. Um, I think some other folks may have some similar type wording trying to get at the same objective. Um, moving on, uh, number six, um, this is a section that, uh, that lifts the jurisdictional threshold of Act 250 for a few years, up to 25 units. Um, and it calls out right now that we're going to lift that threshold in downtowns, neighborhoods, and growth centers. We think it's really important to include the villages in that, uh, to include rural towns. Um, so if I can make fun of Chittenden County, you know, a lot of the designations are in Chittenden County right now. Uh, we need to help the rest of the state get into the game uh, and allowing uh, village centers. Um, we, we suggest that maybe plus a quarter mile buffer, but even if just villages plus the neighborhood development areas are uh, get the same benefit, that this would be helpful. Um, and um, we also have another little suggestion there because we're defining housing unit in this section in Act 250, or uh, sorry, it doesn't define housing unit, but because we are in the planning section of the statute, Maybe we should 
do a parallel definition in Act 50 so that both sections of the statute are uh, working from a common definition. Um, section uh, number seven here on the letter and the uh, designation of village centers. Um, and this is about the priority housing projects in villages. I would allow it within village, village centers. Um, we're suggesting again, maybe being able to go beyond uh, the village center. Um, this could be a quarter mile from the, from the designation of the village center, or again, maybe the village center plus the neighborhood de uh, development area. Um, and then um, this one is pretty important, number eight. Last year, there was a change in the neighborhood development area uh, statutory language that removed this requirement to have wastewater systems and kind of allow communities to plan to increase density and then you know, get to the wastewater at a later date with the development helping to pay for that. Um, this would take us backwards. Uh, and so we're, we're suggesting that that new language gets struck. Um, and uh, it's really counterproductive. I think it would be very counterproductive for some small towns that are doing um, segregated, not just segregated, but decentralized wastewater systems. Um, it would really uh, set them back and really, I think, even stop towns from looking at wastewater solutions that might really need them. Um, we have some, I, I guess I can pause after the high, that was our high priority list. Yeah, Representative Sevilla. Just a quick question. Um, I, and I've we've heard the testimony about the designation areas and that they were more around taxes than land use. Um, so on the face of it, I definitely support the quarter mile buffer. I just wonder if there's any rationale for that measure that, yeah. you, that you would. That's actually the um, base rationale for the neighborhood development area. It's a quarter mile outside yeah. of the center. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I'm kind of saying that in, if, in lieu of, but again, um, and this language, and maybe we should update this letter to kind of say, um, I think there's been some other language about if they have uh, zoning and subdivision uh, regulations also probably an important factor um, and not just allow where there are no regulations. Um, I hope. Um, some of the um, medium priority edits is a clarification in section one about parking. And this is just about um, the number, you know, it's trying to uh, uh, have a more of a minimum requirement. Um, and we understand how this works here. You know, municipalities can require, you know, what, whatever, two or three units or parking spaces per unit. Now, if they're only allowed to require one or one and a half spaces per unit, it doesn't mean the builder can't build more, right? And I think this is an important thing every time I talk about this, uh, this is just stopping the local government from requiring excessive parking. The builder or property owner needs to build as much parking as they need. Uh, this doesn't prevent that from happening. Um, However, we just have a little clarification because it was a little confusing because at 1.5 and there was about this language about the municipalities may round up to the nearest full parking space. Some of them were thinking that that meant, well, we'll round it up to two. Is that what they mean? Like, no, that's not what we mean. But when you have multiple units and you, you know, if you have three units, you don't do 4.5, you either got to build four or five so they can round it up to five right, when you add up for multiple units. Um, so just a, a little bit of wording to make that clear. Um, section nine on appeals. Um, this is, again, just uh, philosophically trying to treat uh, designated places similarly. We think that the new town centers and the village centers should be added to this section, um, that uh, they can't get appealed based on the character of the area. Um, uh, number 11 here is uh, a note about a section that was deleted. Um, and I think it got deleted kind of through the appropriations committee because it had $300,000 attached for regional planning commissions to provide services as housing navigators. Uh, we still support that, uh, that function or, or section if you wanted to add it back in. And I, I don't understand the dynamics between appropriators and policy committees. So... <laughs> That's as far as I'm going to venture there. <laughs> so, uh, we still support that. And then uh, at the end here, we have just some um, clarifying. Um, number 12 is really, I think, just more educational. Um, 
both of those sections talk about the uh, regional plan and the municipal plan. Um, and again, I'm just, just repeating what I said earlier, like we're getting requests for targets and we think that section is very important to keep in there. Um, and we've done something similar with energy planning. They, they remember a few years ago. Um, the section 17C, comment number 13, um, this is a recommendation to study lifting the threshold up to 25. Um, we think it would be important to also kind of look at the five year, five mile portion of that, right? It's all three components are in that jurisdictional threshold. 10 units within five years, within five miles. We think, let's, let's look at all three components of that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the number of units. Maybe it's more about um, you know, how many years or how many, or what the distance is that should be looked at as well. Um, and section 14, I'm sorry, I'm getting near the end. I, this is painful for me also. Um, <laughs> so, uh, section 19, um, there's, this is about enhanced designation. Uh, this is, I'm not sure how to characterize this section. Um, more work needs to be done in this section. Um, <laughs> so it's not really, a designation, it's kind of written more like a delegation of like, uh, hey, if you, if you, uh, your local zoning is as good as what the Natural Resources Board says Act 250 is, they'll, they'll let you have jurisdiction, right? So it's more of a delegation. Um, we do think this, this needs some more work. Um, I was tempted to, to bring forth some of the uh, languages. There's a couple pages of edits that I think some of the municipalities have been working on, uh, particularly the more like solidly urban municipalities, like this kind of came from Winooski and Burlington, like, you know, they're not dealing with rural areas, they're not dealing with a lot of things that are in Act 250. Um, and, they're, and Act 250, uh, from my perspective, frankly, hasn't added a lot of value in those urban places. Those places are built, they're infilling, redeveloping. Um, but what's, what's there now? in terms of this section and language is probably not workable. There is some language out there. Um, I know that the city of Burlington has produced. I'm happy to produce that if you're interested. Um, but um, but this needs more work. <laughs> uh, we're going to hear from the city tomorrow. OK. Uh, I, I will carry that message better than I can. But there's sort of three pieces to this. And you only have one in yours. So there's. Um, one piece of it is the delegation, but then I think there's two enhanced proposals in here. I th like there's in section 19. Um, well, not in section 19, but in the bill. Yeah, yeah. I'm only talking about this particular section. Yeah. Um, number of comment 15. Um, we do support uh, looking at the energy code. That was the end of my uh, substantive comments. <coughs> and it, but other than to say, um, you know, we realize this is not the full picture of the permitting system, right? This is kind of very focused on the municipal aspect of our permitting system. And I'm using the permitting system as a purposeful phrase. We have municipalities, Act 250, and state agencies, mostly DEC, but also VTRANS, involved in our permitting system in Vermont. Um, this, this bill is making a lot of positive changes on the municipal side and just um, just kind of a plug of we need to kind of marry up what happens in Act 250 to support uh, smart growth and, and environmental protection that are in Vermont also. So um, hoping that happens at uh, maybe a later date. I know it's not in this bill now um, and happy. And we also think that like the work that we might do under H5 and the, the other Act 250 studies, you know, we'll, we'll be better informed by the end of this calendar year. Uh, in terms of Act 250 suggestions for you all. So just leave that on the table there. Um, I need to take any more questions, but thank you for your patience and listening to all of that detail. Yeah, thank you for your testimony. Um, I have a question about the parking piece of it, which I, I totally get why we you know, don't need to mandate, or towns you know, could have been over mandating perhaps parking, but the flip side of that is if, there's not enough parking in town, the town will have to provide it. I mean, if there's not enough parking at a development, the town will have to provide it. I know Middlebury has, a few, has some spaces like that for uh, probably apartments downtown that are designated overnight parking. Overnight parking can be a challenge for towns when they're trying to manage for snow. 
Actually, my mind's eye is going to this particular parking lot, which is a challenge, <laughs> but um, meeting a need, I guess I, have we struck the right balance? I mean, I think the offset cost of towns could potentially be there. Yeah, and I, that's also a negotiation that happens with each development project, right? Um, I kind of uh, get back to the point that the property owner or the developer you know, doesn't want to do anything to undermine their ability to lease up their apartments, right? If the renter can't park a car somewhere. Um, but I, I think the bigger thing that's going on, and this is this provision here is a conversation that's going on nationally. This is um, a best considered best practice in the planning profession to start reducing the number of parking spaces that are being required. But some of that is reflect, reflecting just a demographic change that's been going on for decades, which is smaller household sizes. Um, and so, you know, we have a lot more one and two person uh, housing units than we did 40 or 50 years ago when I was growing up. Um, so, sorry, I'm, I'm there, but you're, I, I, and I don't mean to undermine what you're saying. Yes, there needs to be some negotiation. Sometimes the city may say, you know, we'd rather share parking with you um, and work out a deal with a build, builder or developer. So that's totally appropriate. Um, I, I don't agree that this, that uh, developers should be just putting infrastructure responsibilities onto the municipalities. I think that that needs to be a conversation that happens with each project. You know, and even though the town may not be requiring, they can also, you know, urge and suggest that they provide adequate parking if there's a concern that they're not. Yeah, well, this would not allow the town to require it. But they couldn't, yeah, that's why I said urge or suggest. So a strong negotiator in that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, all right. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. And I have one question, uh, one, one comment. You, you mentioned getting language to us about how to incorporate H5. Um, You're saying just incorporate H5 as is. H5 is fine the way it is. If that's, uh, I figured that was probably the easiest path. Um, yeah, it, there's, there's a, may take us a little longer than is in there right now, but that's, yeah, I think that's fine. We can work with you after the fact. Thank you, and thank you for your uh, submitting the written yeah. specific. Yeah, and thanks to all my friends at the RPC for having <laughs> Thank you very much. Right. Next up, we have Peter Tucker, Vermont Association of Realtors. Please join us. <clears throat> Physical chairs. Welcome. Thank you. Morning, uh, Mr. Sheldon, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for in inviting us here today to speak. Um, I'm Peter Tucker. I am the uh, Director of Advocacy and Public Policy for the Realtor Association. Um, and first of all, I'd like to apologize. Um, my additional witness, Graham Mink, who is a, it was in the midst of a, a fairly big project in Morristown, um, is not gonna be able to make it today. Um, but I would encourage this committee to, 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 to reach out to some small builders um, to try and get their opinion of how Act 250 has impacted uh, their work. Um, and we heard from a number of different folks in Senate Economic and Housing, uh, but the Natural Resources Committee didn't hear from builders in the Senate. And I thought we've missed an opportunity there. So I hope you have time to, to you know, search out some of those smaller builders um, and, you know, we'll, I know VHFA has, has had a couple of uh, witnesses that have testified in the past. Um, so our, our comments today are, are really, you know, around S100. Um, you know, the Vermont Association of Realtors represents 1,800 members and, uh, you know, spread all across the state who work with uh, homeowners and, and folks uh, trying to achieve the dream of homeownership. Um, you know, we're on the front line in the housing industry. And, you know, if there's a housing crisis or a lack of inventory, um, we really feel that, um, you know, it, it's impacted our business. You know, people have stopped me in the street and said, oh, you're a realtor. The last couple of years must just be, you know, phenomenally good for your business. Um, but put yourself in the, in the, the seat of a, a realtor who is working with a buyer who is bidding on a house that has, multiple bits, 10, 15 bits, it's slowed down now, but you know, for a great period of that time, it was a superheated marketplace. Um, you know, and if it's 15 bits, one person wins and 14 people lose. And representing, you know, folks that have been beaten out, um, you know, is, is really 
a very difficult uh, position for realtors to be in. Um, you know, it is, I'm concerned about the folks that we chased away from the marketplace. We didn't have the right property for them. Um, they went through a series of frustrating uh, bids and, and then just said, look, you know, we're going to hold off. And now, of course, we have a little bit higher interest rates too. So, you know, all those things impacting. Um, you know, when we think about Vermont, um, you know, it, it really, you know, the goal of uh, supporting traditional compact development um, is in villages. You know, when I think about quintessential Vermont, that's that's where it is. Um, certainly, we have bigger cities as well. But but, you know, when I think about the landscape of Vermont, it's you know going over a hill into a valley into a small village. Um, that, that provides housing and, and opportunities for folks. Um, section one through 10 of the bill, you know, deal with municipal, uh, municipal zoning and bylaw changes. And, you know, we're, we're generally in favor of those changes. We know that, that those are the kinds of things that will help spur some housing, especially in, in municipalities and, and downtowns. Um, you know, I, I just I have to say that, that Ted Brady and Karen Horn at the Vermont League of Cities and Towns have, I mean, I can't imagine the discussions that they must have had with their members who said, look, all this municipal zoning stuff is our purview. We shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't have the state regulating it, but they got some acceptance there. And I, and I think that, that, um, you know, a lot of that acceptance was, you know, hope, a uh, hope for balance. You know, we'll make these municipal changes if we see the state make some changes in their land use and planning, you know, Act 250 generally. Um, so they were really, you know, they, they, they reached out, you know, they went out on a limb a long ways. And I think uh, they deserve an awful lot of credit, you know, for being uh, supportive of, of this bill so far. Um, from the, from, and I've got 25 years as a broker, came in to, I did volunteer work as government affairs uh, chair and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, from, from the get-go, we have been talking about the 1055 rule in Act 250 and saying, look, this needs revision. Um, you know, to hear Mr. Baker talk about maybe we need to look at the five and the five. I mean, I think that's a, a perfect solution, quite honestly. But, you know, we're, we're headed down a different path right now. Um, you know, so so it's something that's restricted housing development, especially with those little guys in small towns. Um, and, and so when the Senate Economic and Development Committee and Housing Committee made that change to increase the, the threshold for the review to 25 units. Um, you know, we, we super appreciated that. Um, Natural Resources Committee and the Senate took a little bit different approach, right? They said, you know, that's just too broad an area, the entire state of Vermont, basically. And so they, they honed that down to, to downtowns, 24 downtowns, um, 12 neighborhood development areas, five of which are associated with those downtowns and six growth centers, uh, three of which are associated with downtowns. So, you know, the net effect is, is like 34 communities in the state. That means that over 200 communities will not be able to take advantage of this particular, um, you know, incentive, if you will, uh, or, you know, increase in the threshold. So, when the bill passed out of uh, out of Senate um, out of the Senate and came over here, um, it, they added a new subsection XI to expand that ten five five rule to twenty five 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 for those those distinct areas. Um, we felt that was too restrictive. Uh, we worked in the Senate to try and get uh, a you know a view of towns that have permanent zoning and bylaw subdivision or subdivision bylaws. Um, the 138 towns that are identified by the Natural Resources Board as uh, 10 acre towns. So they've already done their planning and zoning bylaws. Um, in many cases, they do have uh, wastewater systems in place um, of one form or another. And, but once again, I think that the Senate rightfully said, look, if we expand 2555 to the entire surface area of these you know 138 towns that doesn't really help in terms of trying to incent development where we want to see housing occur compact settlement smart growth downtowns neighborhoods villages um, you know in in those those areas so you know now there's a, a discussion about um, adding village centers and I think that that's you know kind of the direction that we need to head in so if we added village centers, 
with um, zoning and bylaw subdivisions, um, you know, you would you would get 138 villages basically, but villages were never really designed to uh, be for housing. They, you know, village the village designation is really a historic tax credit for facade improvements, elevators, uh, lead paint abatement, things of that nature to you know to encourage uh, vibrant uh, downtown villages. Um, so. I, I, and I heard uh, Mr. Baker also mention, you know, possibly extending, you know, village centers plus this quarter mile, um, you know, what I would call a neighborhood development area, because that's really the definition of neighborhood development areas around villages is a quarter mile. Um, and that would be fantastic. Um, but we kind of took a different look at it and said, well, how can you get bigger than the village center, but not the entire town basically and you know many of these villages do have wastewater systems in place or community or alternative uh, systems and that would extend that village center um, or just slight i mean to, to you know each town's made its own decisions on you know where they provide you know wastewater services um but in, in an effort to try and make this a little bit more accessible to more rural communities, um, understanding that it's not the entire area of the town, but rather in those compact development areas that we ideally like to incent development. So, so that's you know that's where this language came from. Um, you know, we proposed some language in in uh, the document that I've handed to you folks. Um, and, it, and it really, you know, builds off of that village center uh, designation, um, but hopefully encourages a slightly broader area. If you decided that you said, hey, we'd like to do, you know, this, this quarter mile around village centers, that's a really great solution. Um, you know, I'm not sure, you know, that, that, you know, I'm not sure what direction you want to head in. So I'm, I'm, I'm uncertain of that, but that would, would certainly help a lot. Um, one thing that, that I didn't really flesh out um, is uh, Section 16B, and this is the, um, the requirement that if you do want to extend uh, to 20, you know, 25 units, five miles, five years, that you would seek a jurisdictional opinion by the Natural Resources Board uh, District Commissioner um, to accomplish that. And it may just be me, I'm a little confused, but but the way this is written, it seems like anybody who goes for a permit for one house who has the potential to then get up to 23 or 24 units would have to get a jurisdictional opinion. Um, I added some some uh, attachments to to my testimony, and there's you know jurisdictional opinion is a five page. I mean it's like a mini Act 250 permit really, and you know I don't. I think you know one of the goals that we hopefully have here is to try and encourage housing more quickly, um, and I just see that as a as a potential uh, drag on you know any kind of, of permitting. Um, but I just I'm I'm not sure. I mean, if you if you're under the ten five five threshold, you don't have to ask for a jurisdictional opinion. If you're under the twenty five five, even under it by twenty four units, it seems to me like this is requiring you to get a jurisdictional opinion. So I'm, I just don't know that the language is accomplishing what, uh, you know, what the goal was to make sure that people who applied, uh, you know, we're going to use the 25-5 threshold, uh, did it in a reasonable time frame. The, the three-year, this was to solve the three-year sunset on, you know, on these provisions um, and then have it completed by 2029, I believe, right? Yep, 2029. So... I, you know, is it is it for folks that go above 10, but less than 24 that need a jurisdictional opinion? Um, I kind of think that's where it was headed, but I'm not sure that's exactly what this says. And I don't have a solution, just, you know, kind of identify that. Um, so the enhanced, there are two enhanced designations that are, you know, proposed to be added to the designations we have right now. And, um, you know, I think that that with a designation report coming back, um, well, it's July 1st or July of this year, but probably more realistically, the end of the year by the time it's accomplished, um, you know, adding designations right now doesn't seem to be incredibly effective. Um, you know, and, and I think that, you know, at the end, I, I've kind of said, look, I mean, you know, we, we really could get down to three designations, you know, downtowns and village centers, 
Those are your kind of your core designations. We understand those neighborhood development areas that are around it. And I guess a growth center and I should, well, they should go with downtowns, village centers and new town centers. And there are at least one or two places in this bill where there are only three new town centers in the state. Um, the one I'm most familiar with is Berlin right now, but they're probably better set up to deal with, you know, wastewater systems and increasing housing than many of the small villages in Vermont. So I think they should be added in to, you know, wherever downtowns are, new town centers ought to be added. Um, and then the surrounding area, which is, a, you know, we call it a neighborhood development area now, but there's only 12 of them. And I, I actually would like to, I think, correct the record. Um, I checked with Jake uh, Hammerth over at, uh, at the agency, and he, and he has confirmed there are 12 approved neighborhood development areas at this point. I know Virgens has just completed their application. There are two pending right now. Um, but I had heard previous testimony that said there's 17 neighborhood development areas. There's 12 only. And, um, and growth centers are just, you know, different areas in those municipalities that want to, you know, uh, specifically target uh, growth areas that they feel are important. Um, so, so those are the kinds of, of things that, that, that we've been thinking about. Um, you know, it could come down to as simple as, as downtowns and, you know, cores, neighborhood development areas where you, you, you know, want to incent housing and all the rest. Um, and, you know, I think that, that as the, as the designation, uh, study gets completed, you know, some form of that is, is going to be what we're going to end up seeing. Um, and we would encourage as well. Um, so with that, um, you know, happy to answer any questions that you folks have. Great. Thank you for your testimony. It is up on our webpage. <clears throat> Members have questions for Mr. Tucker. Lunch is early today. Thank you again for your testimony. Yeah. But, and I hope those attachments, you know, I mean, this is kind of how I do my research, you know, is to, is to, to dig in and try and figure out when we're talking about 24 downtowns, where are they, you know? And I was surprised. I mean, they're not in Chittenden County. They're kind of spread around the state pretty good. Um, so, you know, there's there's definitely some some interesting data that's out there. We just it's hard to pull it together in the one place. Yes, and actually, just <clears throat> some members know looking under Peter Tucker's name um, will bring you to uh, the data he's talking about. It's, it is very helpful. Thank you for providing it. Representative Sevilla. Uh, so specifically <clears throat> on um, some of your pieces of data that you provided. Just help me with it a little bit. Sure. Um, what. What, uh, what it's telling us uh, for the wastewater uh, detail there. How is that? Right. How, so how should, I, how should I utilize that information when thinking about? What I did, and I, hopefully I sorted it correctly for you guys, was my, well, it's here somewhere. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I did sort it on industrial and residential category or, you know, so that when you look at it, it's, it's around 100, 106 communities is the way I kind of figured it out um, that have, you know, uh, have a wastewater system approved by the agency. Um, and there may be some others. There may be, you know, some that are, you know, kind of duplicative in towns. Um, but I just looked at that, that municipal um, list, which is the second half. Well, let me get to mine. I think it's the second half of the list is the way it kind of worked out. Sorry. Um, so that, you know, it, it does have a list of all the towns that have, you know, approved, uh, wastewater systems. So that's, that is what this, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And it, it is sorted by industrial and municipal. Yeah. It starts with industrial, but if you go down a page or two, you get to the, yeah. and the municipal section. But I would assume the industrial, they're private. They're just larger systems that are I just. Yeah, I mean, and I, yeah, exactly. And I just figured they were available for residential, so you know, didn't didn't have, you know count them in. But I did try to understand, you know, for Burlington, I think has four or five, you know, approved wastewater plants. So you know, I counted. I I did kind of go through and and parse those out so that I got down to a list of, you know, I, I was at 106. I'm not sure that's exactly the right number, but somewhere in that range. You know, just trying to. To take this twenty-five-five-five incentive and expand it, uh, uh, you know, to what is a reasonable area, 
um, that was our goal. However, I listened to the planner say that stuff's probably not a great way to, to look at things. So, um, you know, I would be incredibly supportive of that quarter mile circle around villages. Um, you know, I've called it uh, neighborhood development areas for everybody, um, you know, and, and that would be obviously the best thing to do. We also really feel strongly that, that you know, maybe don't have to increase the unit threshold. If you got rid of the five miles in five years, um, that would allow these, you know, and we're looking at small towns, uh, about builders in small towns, able to continue with projects in their town where they're, they're mobilized, where they have their subs uh, and not have to go, I've got to go five, five miles down the road or, or greater to do my next project. Um, so the five, five really could have a, a significant impact um, without having to change the, um, you know, the, the, the level, the number. Great. Thanks for your testimony. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Um, members, we have um, testimony after the floor today. We, we took the risk of scheduling it for a specific time, but you know it's scheduled to start at two. Um, so hopefully that ends up being about the right time. Oh yeah, we will find time for those. We do have two amendments on S five that we need to take up, so we'll look for where we need to add those to the agenda. With that, we'll adjourn for lunch.